Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for the fourth and final part of the Shanda Share case. I'm almost a little sad that we're finished with this case now because I've been living with Shanda for so long and it just feels a little bit like I'm leaving her behind now that I'm finishing up this series of videos, but I never really leave any of them behind and I'm sure that you guys don't either. When we had last left off, both Lori Tackett and Melinda Loveless were under arrest and the DA was trying to decide whether this would be a death penalty case or not. A month after Shanda's death, Tony and Hope were still ghosts. They hadn't gone to school, they hadn't spoken to any of their friends, and they didn't see each other at all even though they did make frequent phone calls to each other. During one of these phone calls, Hope confessed to Tony that it had been she who had first poured the gasoline onto Shanda. Now this was a surprise to Tony, who claimed she hadn't been looking when this had happened, but this wasn't a surprise to the police. Remember, Melinda hadn't been friends with Hope. She'd only just met her that night. She had no loyalty to this girl, and she'd already told her lawyer, Mike Walro, what Hope had done, and he'd told the police. Now, both Tony and Hope's parents claimed their daughters were so frightened of some sort of retribution that they couldn't even sleep at night. They couldn't sleep alone, and they would wake up screaming with nightmares. So we're supposed to feel bad for Hope and Tony that they can't sleep at night because they're worried that Lori and Melinda are gonna come for them. Not that they can't sleep at night because they took part in the horrific murder of an innocent 12-year-old girl. That's not why they're losing sleep. That's not why they're having nightmares. They're having nightmares because they're scared for their own lives. The police and the prosecution were not impressed with the disappearing act that Hope and Tony had pulled, especially as they began to get more information from Melinda and Lori, which suggested that Hope and Tony played a bigger part in the murder than they had originally disclosed. The police decided they needed to arrest these two girls as well, and like it does in small towns and big towns too, if we're being honest. Gossip about their impending arrest made its way around town and it made its way to Hope and Tony as well, so their parents agreed to bring them into the Madison Courthouse on the morning of March 15th. Most likely in an effort to make it look like they were cooperating and the girls were gonna turn themselves in, but they already knew they were gonna get arrested anyways and they didn't come out of hiding until they knew they were already going to be arrested and charged, so you do with that what you will. Both Hope and Tony were charged with murder, arson, battery with a deadly weapon, aggravated battery, criminal confinement, and intimidation. That same day, Melinda and Lori also appeared in front of the court to hear their new charges, which included child molestation and criminal deviant conduct. Obviously, out of the four girls, Tony was the weak link. She had the least amount of blood on her hands, and she'd also been the one to first break their pact of silence. So a plea deal was offered to her. They would dismiss all charges against her besides criminal confinement. She would plead guilty to criminal confinement, and in exchange, she would testify against the other three. It's so very similar to the Manson girls, and as I researched this case, the parallel struck me more and more. The night of the Tate murders, you had Leslie Van Houten, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian, also Tex Watson, of course, but they all went there. They all went there together to kill people, but only three of them took an active role. Linda Kasabian claimed she had not wanted to take part and she acted as a lookout instead. And two months later, she was the one who turned herself in and became the lead witness for the prosecution. As a result, she was given a deal. As much as we can recognize and appreciate Linda's help in putting the others behind bars where they belonged, we can also recognize her complicity. She didn't do anything. She didn't go to get help. She didn't try to stop it. She didn't take part, but she didn't do anything to end it. And that's exactly where we find ourselves with Tony Lawrence. I guess the question now is, which one's Susan Atkins, who by far is the worst, most violent and disgusting of them all? Is it Lori or is it Melinda? I'm thinking it's Lori. Definitely thinking it's Lori. The prosecutor Townsend recognized the importance of Tony's testimony. She was there. She could paint a picture of what had happened and who had done what but she still needed to pay a price for looking the other way while an innocent life was taken right in front of her. And I say this with the knowledge of how hard what I'm asking people to do 
can actually be. But sometimes doing nothing is just as bad as doing something, right? It's the bystander effect. It's the thing inside of us that makes us stand by while somebody gets bullied or beat up in high school. It's the thing inside of us that makes us stand by while a woman gets harassed on the street and somebody grabs her purse and runs away. We don't want to get involved. And we talked about this a little bit during the Alphabet Murders video. I'll put it in the description box if you're interested in checking it out. And I will also put the uh, seven-part Manson series that I did in the description box in case you haven't seen it. Melinda's friend Carrie Pope was also working with law enforcement behind the scenes. Sort of. It was a little bit more complicated with Carrie. Carrie, like many of these other young girls, didn't know who she was or what she wanted, or how she felt. Melinda was writing Carrie letters from jail showing that she clearly hadn't learned from what had happened. Her being behind bars hadn't taught her the ultimate lesson of humility. Amanda had not been in contact with Melinda since she'd been put behind bars, so Melinda had turned her attention once again to Carrie Pope, as she had done so many times previously when Amanda had spurned her. Six months after she had murdered Shanda Scherer, Melinda wrote to Carrie from jail. In one breath, she said she wanted them to be more than friends, but she recognized that they were both too messed up and insecure to have only one partner. In the next breath, she was telling Carrie to drop the girl she'd been seeing, Angie, because Carrie deserved better, saying, quote, You deserve the best, like me, Carrie. You took an innocent life six months ago, you were traumatized by it allegedly according to you, and now you're back in the saddle ready to just get your romance on again? And just the same as she had done with Amanda, which had pushed Amanda away to begin with, she starts telling Carrie who she can talk to, who she can date, who she shouldn't see, who she shouldn't date, because why would you want anybody other than me, the best? Lori Tackett was also writing to Carrie from prison, and only 10 days after Shanda's death, she sent Carrie a poem she had written titled, The Forest. Here is that poem. The forest burns, the children scream, shadows await to take souls unseen. Stones that mark death await for their calling, innocence allies with evil hence falling. Their father stands watching, laughing in victory. His servants surround him, struggling to be free from the chains that bound them to his ebony throne. From the ground calleth voices which once had been known. They scuffle about until one breaks free, stumbling, half smiling with its hideous smiles, then reaching the knees of an innocent baby crying in fear as the forest burns on. Listen and hear. The author of Little Lost Angel, Michael Quinlan, believes this poem had been inspired by Shanda's death on Lemon Road, and I agree to, to a point, but I also clearly see Lori's inability to take accountability for what she's done, pulling the old, the devil made me do it. Their father stands watching, laughing in victory, his servants are struggling to be free from his ebony throne. She was a servant of the devil, bound to him, a slave, who had no free will in what she was doing, since it was his will. And who was she to fight back against the power of Satan himself? But don't worry, don't, don't worry too much about Lori over here. She was able to break free from the ebony throne long enough to fall in love shortly into her prison stay, writing to Carrie that Carrie couldn't come and visit anymore or write letters because her new girlfriend, Kim, was jealous. She said, quote, for the last two weeks, I've been doing a lot of soul searching and I realized that I do love Kim. She has stuck beside me from the beginning and she has never judged me. The first night I was here, I was crying and upset. I didn't know her and she didn't know me, but she told me that if I needed someone to talk to, that she was here for me. Sure, she's overprotective, but now I understand why. Carrie, I love her. And if anything ever happens to us, I could never have anyone else. What we have is real, and I hope you can understand. She knows things about me that nobody else knows. Things that, if given time, you would have known. Another letter to Carrie followed, but this one was from the prison girlfriend, Kim, saying, quote, 
We got your letter yesterday, and Mary asked me to respond. Mary, known to you as Lori, explained to you that she wished no communication with you. I've read your statement against her, and I really don't see how you even have the nerve to write. To me, you're a very mixed-up kid that Mary doesn't want or need in her life. Mary is and will be doing fine because she has realness in her life now. Me. Understand, or would you like me to draw you a picture? You've got my address if you're not bright enough to understand understand this letter. I'm always willing to help a kid out. Bye, Kim, Mary's wife. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't do this. It's ridiculous. You know my address? You're in prison. Everyone knows your address, Kim. I don't know what the heck was going on with Carrie. To be fair, Kim may have had her own share of issues. I would argue she did. But she was right about one thing. Carrie was a very mixed up kid. On one hand, she went to the police confessing that she and the Leatherberries had been considering going out to find Tony's parents and hurt them for their daughter turning on the other girls. Yes, that's what she actually said to the police. What's going on with the kids in this town? On the other hand, she seemed to have developed a real sort of codependent relationship with Lori and Melinda, knowing what they had done admitting that these girls scared the living hell out of her, but still insisting to write and visit, even after Lori's prison wife had threatened her not to. By the summer, Carrie was writing to Lori saying that she didn't want to testify against her, that she didn't even want to go on living because her life had become so messed up by Lori just messing with her emotions and her heart. She said in this letter, quote, I care for Melinda and you. Nothing will ever change how I feel about both of you, end quote. The close-knit bond between Lori, Melinda, and Carrie would not last, as illustrated by a letter Lori sent another friend, a girl named Missy. Now, this had been a girl she'd been tutoring in the dark arts before her life had completely changed and she'd gotten herself locked up. She told Missy that Melinda was trying to pin everything on her and hope. But Lori knew the truth. Melinda was happy that Shanda was gone and she carried no remorse or regret for it. She just wished she hadn't gotten caught. For once, Lori and I agree. But that's about where the continuity between the Lori's opinions and mine end. She was extremely full of hate. She was extremely racist, using the N-word when describing the people in prison she hated the most. I guess when those kids at school accused her of being a skinhead, they weren't so far off. She also said in these letters that she hated Melinda so much she felt Melinda didn't deserve anything but a hot curling iron up her ass. Now remember what happened to Shanda. Remember what happened to Shanda and none of these girls fessed up to who did it. I wonder who did it. It was only a month later when Lori had been transferred to the Indiana Women's Prison, the same place Melinda was being held, when she and Melinda were best friends again. It's legitimately like an episode of Orange is the New Black that never ends. She wrote to her friend Misi, Melinda is here now and we're friends again. She's so cute. I couldn't be mad at her anymore. But the real reason I'm not mad anymore is because I'm as guilty as she is. We were in it together and I can't be mad. I mean, she didn't force me to be there. She just sort of trapped me. At any rate, I won't hate her. I could have stopped it from happening, but I didn't. End quote. Remember this brief glimmer of introspection because later Lori would say she had felt very differently. She also admitted to going in front of the judge wearing a pretty dress and professing to be turning to her religion for help. But then she claimed to her friend Misi that this had all been a sham, just a performance to put on and lead people to believe she was an innocent little girl who had just been led down a dark path. I'm feeling really sassy today. I feel like all the anger that I've held towards these girls in the last three parts is just going to just spill out in this video. So you've been warned. Guy Townsend, the head prosecutor, was trying to get Hope, Melinda, and Lori to accept a plea deal, a plea that would entail to them admitting guilt to just one count of murder. Just one count of murder. After everything they did, all they had to do was say they were guilty to one count of murder. But the girl's lawyer said they wouldn't even consider it unless Townsend could guarantee that they would only receive a sentence of 40 years or less with the possibility of parole after 20. Well, Townsend could not offer these girls that deal, number one, because it's, it's wrong. That's not enough time to serve for what they did. And also, public opinion of this sort of, you know, behind-the-scenes deal would not be great. 
with his back to the wall, Townsend filed to bring the maximum sentence against Lori and Melinda, the death penalty. He knew it would most likely never stick, but he hoped it would motivate them to be more open to a plea deal. He told them that if they accepted his offer, he would take the death penalty off the table and drop all the other charges except for murder, arson, and criminal confinement, but he would recommend that the sentences for these ran concurrently, meaning that they, they happen all at once instead of one after the other, which I still think is a sweetheart deal for these girls, but okay. Tony Lawrence, even after agreeing to testify against these these other girls and, and getting her plea agreement, she was still in, in prison. Like, they left her behind bars. So she was getting worse and worse by the day. She was obviously not happy, confined to a cell, which is what happens when you take part in a murder. You go to prison. So, yeah, you're not supposed to be happy or comfortable. In August, she attempted to take her own life by stockpiling her daily antidepressant and then taking it all at once. She was in a coma for five days and afterwards she was sent to a hospital in Indianapolis for psychiatric care. She was discharged on October 8th with a report that stated Tony had gotten used to getting her way with her parents for most of her life and she often made decisions on what to do based on whether or not she would get caught and not based on whether it was right or wrong. Tony had admitted to her therapist that she had taken the pills not because she actually wanted to die, but because her parents were going out of town and she felt abandoned. She hadn't actually meant to take her own life. She just wanted attention. She wanted her parents to know how pissed she was that they were going out of town while she was sitting in a jail cell. Sounds about right. Overall, her therapist had determined Tony was a follower with intelligence in the low to average range. The therapist said Tony felt bad about what had happened to Shanda, but she also didn't think she had done anything wrong because she hadn't hurt Shanda with her own two hands. It was decided that if Tony was able to get proper counseling, she could be morally repaired and join society. This is a controversial issue, I think. Can people be morally repaired once you're morally broken? I'm going to look into that a little bit and do some research because I would definitely be interested to see what the, uh, what the studies are on that. On September 21st, Melinda and Lori accepted Guy Townsend's plea deal with the understanding that they would now be pitted against each other and be expected to give testimony about what the other girl had done during each of their respective sentencing hearings. Once again, Melinda and Lori were arch enemies. Their temporary prison sisterhood shattered forever. So here's what Lori said. Get ready, guys. It's good. She claimed that she, Hope, and Tony had no idea what Melinda planned to do to Shanda that evening. She herself had not beaten Shanda up that night in the woods by her house, only Melinda had. And when they went back to her house and they heard Shanda crying from the trunk, all Lori had done was go to the car, open the trunk, and put a blanket over Shanda because she was cold. It was Melinda who suggested they drive around and figure out what to do with Shanda. It was Melinda who suggested setting her on fire and Melinda who poured the gasoline. As to who had actually lit the match that started the fire, Lori had no idea. She said she'd been leaning over Shanda, concerned for her, trying to talk to her and offer her words of comfort when all of a sudden the fire roared upwards at her, singeing her bangs. I don't know who lit it, she said. The fire just went up into my face all of a sudden. It wasn't me. Hope and Melinda were standing around her, and I personally feel Melinda did it. Steve Henry and Sheriff Shipley were the ones questioning her, and they knew very well she was lying. Not only had Hope already admitted to having been the one to first pour gasoline on Shanda, but the other girls had all identified Lori as the one who had lit the match. When they asked Lori why she had not tried to get Shanda help, she said it was because she'd been scared. She said no one would understand unless they'd been there. They were all under the influence of Melinda, and they knew if they tried to get Shanda help, they would still get into trouble. But would you be facing murder charges, Lori? Would you? Would you? Mm -mm. Lori was asked who had sexually abused Shanda. She said she didn't know, but it wasn't them. 
she was asked how Shanda had gotten such a large wound on the back of her head. Lori shrugged and said, probably from banging around in the trunk. Lori was asked if she'd ever hit Shanda with a tire iron. She said no, but she said Melinda had stopped the car plenty of times and gone to the trunk. So if anyone had hit Shanda with a tire iron, it was probably Melinda. As for all of the, you know, the details, the little details, like where were you driving? How long were you driving for? How many times did you stop, etc.? Lori couldn't remember anything, claiming, quote, it's totally blacked out from the time we were out on that country road to the time we got back to my house. She couldn't even remember whether she had blood on her when she got home, even though the other girls all said she did. Melinda's story was obviously very different. The only thing was, her version of events matched up very closely to Tony's and Hope's. But remember, Hope and Tony were not there when Lori and Melinda were beating Shanda up in the forest. They'd been in the car with the radio turned up so they couldn't hear anything. And Melinda knew this. She admitted to punching Shanda, but said after she was satisfied and she felt she had taught her a lesson, she told Lori that they needed to bring her home. And that's when Lori looked at her and said, we can't. Talking about Lori, Melinda said, quote, she just went off. I walked over by the car and Tackett still had her. Shanda called me to help, but I didn't do nothing. Tackett had her on the ground and was choking her with a rope. She put it around Shanda's neck and started strangling her. I guess she was unconscious because she stopped kicking. I thought she was dead, end quote. It was then Melinda claimed that Lori started cutting Shanda, telling Melinda that they needed to finish Shanda off. And when Melinda said no, get this, get this, Lori took Melinda's hand and placed it on top of hers while it was holding the knife and then started stabbing Shanda. <laughs> oh, okay, Melinda. As for the tire iron, Melinda said she had never actually seen Lori hit Shanda with it, but she'd heard it. And about the molestation that Lori had claimed to have no knowledge of, well, Melinda had no knowledge of it either. She felt that Lori was the only one who'd had the opportunity to do it. There had been a point while they were driving around that they'd stopped and Lori went back to the trunk. She didn't come back to the car for a while and Melinda could hear screaming on and off. Now, Melinda had actually been thriving in prison, walking around the place like the Queen of Sheba, expecting special treatment due to her high profile status. If you guys remember the Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume case that we did, I'll put it in the description box if you haven't seen it. This is exactly how Pauline Parker acted when she went to jail. The jail's administration had received dozens of letters, and in these letters were requests from Melinda that ranged from more visitation with family and friends to a more comfortable uniform. Melinda gave out autographs to her fellow inmates and hung a picture of herself on the wall of her cell with the words most wanted written on it. She had also managed to obtain a copy of her high school yearbook. And over the picture of Shanda Scherer, she had written, so young, so pretty, had to die early. Melinda had not lost her sex drive while behind bars. She was reported to have hickeys all over her body, spotted by a female jailer while Melinda was changing for court one day. Melinda had also gotten herself a girlfriend from the inmate population. And she also had been caught having sex with a male jailer in a command post room. And while all of this is happening, while Melinda was reveling in her notoriety and spreading her love and hate equally around, her mother was planning to sell their home in order to pay for a defense attorney. Now, this is um, a little bit of a complicated situation. So both Lori and Melinda had been given public defenders because their family said were too poor to pay for a lawyer. So they were given public defenders. But then somehow they were able to bring on this attorney, Russell Johnson from Franklin, Indiana, who was one of the best murder defense lawyers in the state. And somehow they were able to get the judge to approve that the public defender money could go towards paying for this guy. But the public defender money is limited at this point. I think it was something like $18,000. And he said, like, I'm not going to work after 18 k 
if I'm not getting paid. So the judge had allowed the state essentially to pay for this, this really big lawyer who was most likely expensive with the understanding that the Loveless family would pay for his hours after that. And everybody was really agitated by that because if you say you can't afford a lawyer and you need a public defender, then you shouldn't get to just pick this high priced attorney that the community basically has to pay for and then when that money's run out you somehow manage to find money to pay for him to continue so that was a big controversy but most likely melinda's mom felt guilty about where her daughter had ended up and the loveless family was going to do all it took to make sure melinda had the best chance of making it out of this with as little time as possible behind bars i want my baby back even if it meant exposing all the dirty little secrets, all the things that had happened in their family that had been previously hidden in the dark. And we did talk about some of these things in the first video and they were admittedly horrible things that no child should ever see or experience. I feel for Melinda and what she had to go through with her father. There's no doubt about that. I've never hidden my venomous dislike for any person who would hurt a child or steal their innocence from them. But we also know that millions of people around the world have faced and do face currently these same circumstances in their childhood. Some of them had it better, some had it worse, but most of them do not go on to kidnap, torture, and brutally murder another person. And those who do need to face punishment regardless of the circumstances that they feel fueled them to the actions of taking another life. I'm not a cruel person, I'm not heartless. I truly do feel for Melinda, but she still did what she did and she needed to pay for it. While the state was building their case against Shanda's killers, Shanda's parents were trying to come to terms with everything that was happening amid a constant barrage of reporters and networks requesting statements and asking for interviews. Steve and Jackie refused to talk to anybody. They didn't want to compromise the case and they also had their own demons to fight away. Steve Scherer did not believe the story that Shanda had gone with these girls that she didn't know willingly. She hadn't taken her coat or her purse, and their family dog, Sparky the Rottweiler, had been left outside, something Shanda would never have done if she knew she was leaving. The next morning, when Steve found Sparky in the driveway, he claimed the dog had a bad limp. Steve believed that Shanda had walked out to the car of her own free will, but once she saw Amanda wasn't in there, she'd tried to leave, but the girls forced her inside, possibly kicking or injuring the dog who was with Shanda trying to protect her. Steve Scherer never got over what happened to his daughter, and he replayed that last night with her over and over and over, feeling that if he had said yes to her friend spending the night, Shanda would still be alive. Jackie, Shanda's mother, was doing the same, remembering that as she dropped her daughter off to school that Friday morning, the last time she'd seen her, Shanda had asked if she could just stay home that weekend instead of going to her dad's. Jackie had convinced Shanda to go, reminding her that Steve's wife Sharon was planning to take her to a Rod Stewart concert that weekend and would be disappointed if Shanda backed out. Jackie eventually became so depressed, she checked herself into a mental health facility in Jeffersonville. It was here she met the man who would eventually save her, 39-year-old ex-army trooper Doug Vaught. They took it slow at first, just acting as a safe and steady place for each other, but on October 2nd, they got married and moved in together. You know who wasn't avoiding the press, though? Lori. At the start of December, Lori put on a pretty flowery sundress and gave an interview to a Cincinnati television station where she added to the already elaborate story of all time of how she was the manipulated one. Now she was claiming she had tried to stop Melinda from hurting Shanda. She said that she'd been hugging Shanda and shouting to Melinda to stop. She said that Shanda had been begging her to not let Melinda hurt her anymore, but there wasn't anything she could do. No one was buying it. Needless to say, this interview did not help 
her image. On a cold, windy day in December of 1992, Melinda Lovelace was marched into court for her sentencing hearing. Her family all showed up to give her support, which she seemed happy about when she walked in until she looked at the other side of the room and saw Shanda's family, fastening her firmly in their accusatory glares. Townsend recounted everything for the audience because that's really what it was. The majority of the people in the courtroom that day had only come to get a glimpse of Melinda and to hear in grotesque detail what had happened. As if they had been watching this television show religiously for years and now they were finally able to see the series finale. There was no jury. This is a sentencing hearing, so there's no jury. It's just a judge who makes the decision. But you had all these reporters and townspeople crowding into the benches just to hear the details. Crime scene pictures were shown to the court, and when Melinda saw them, she moaned out loud before putting her head on the table and crying. When Steve Henry took the stand, he was cross-examined by Melinda's fancy lawyer, Russell Johnson, who was handsome and young, but also very effective. He asked Steve Henry about the statement Lori made, saying that she had no idea who had lit the match that would eventually be the nail in Shanda's coffin. And he asked Steve Henry if he believed Lori. Steve Henry responded, quote, no, sir, I do not, end quote. It was very clear that Melinda's lawyers were interested in pushing as much blame off on Lori as they could. When Tony took the stand giving testimony that was incredibly damning to Melinda, including the fact that she'd been laughing and happy when she got back in the car after pouring more gasoline on Chanda, one of Melinda's lawyers asked her point blank who had been the first person that night to mention murder, and she admitted it had been Lori. All eyes were on the next person walking towards the witness stand. Lori Tackett, in a dress, of course, was ready to launch into all the details, saying shocking things to get a reaction out of people was her specialty, after all. But she tripped herself up a bit. When she testified that she'd checked on Shanda in the trunk and put a blanket over her and then lowered the trunk, she said she didn't lower it all the way, only half the way. Everyone in the courtroom was confused. Lori had claimed Shanda was conscious and still alive when she checked in on her. She was shivering, so Lori gave her a blanket. But then she didn't shut the trunk all the way? If all that Lori had said was true, and she didn't open the trunk and stab Shanda several times, why hadn't Shanda escaped from the open trunk? This was not lost on Melinda's lawyer, Russ Johnson. He stood in front of Lori and asked her, quote, When you went outside, Shanda was conscious because she was screaming and banging. Is that right? End quote. Lori was walking right into a trap and she didn't even know it. She answered, Yes, that's right. Johnson asked a follow-up question, quote, Was she still screaming after you put the blanket on her and left? End quote. Lori responded, yes. Johnson went in for the kill, speaking to Lori, but meaning his words to land firmly with the judge and the rest of the people watching. He said, quote, let me understand this. This little girl was screaming and banging on the trunk and you leave the trunk open and she just lies there screaming and banging. If someone's banging on the lid of that trunk and it's not shut, I assume the trunk's gonna fly open. She wasn't screaming when you left was she? End quote. At that point, Lori saw she'd stepped into quicksand, and by the time she realized it, she'd already sunk into her waist. She tried to backpedal and say that Shanda actually hadn't been really making that much of a fuss when she'd walked away, but Johnson peppered her with questions. Isn't it true you told Crystal Waithin that when Shanda started screaming, you hit her in the head with a tire iron? Isn't it a fact that you not only hit her with a tire iron, but you also molested her? Didn't you tell Mr. Leatherberry you would love to see someone burn? Lori Tackett was trapped, and it would only get worse for her from there. If she had planned on placing all the blame with Melinda and convincing the judge that she was just another victim, there was really no chance of that now. Amanda Heverin was also questioned during Melinda's sentencing hearing. Things between Jerry Heverin and Jackie Scherer had quickly deteriorated. He felt that Jackie was trying to pull Amanda into this and place blame on her for bringing Shanda into this world and this group of people. Amanda admitted on the stand that she and Shanda had been lovers. 
One by one, friends of Lori's and Melinda's took the stand and recounted how often both girls had made clear their violent tendencies, especially Melinda when it came to Shanda. Lori had always been down for the opportunity to kill anyone, really, but it was Melinda who was focused on Shanda. Carrie Pope recalled that Melinda talked about killing Shanda almost every day. Many witnesses had already seen Carrie embrace Melinda in the hall and whisper something in her ear which made Melinda laugh. When Carrie was asked by Townsend what it was that she had whispered, Carrie confessed, quote, I told her that I hope Lori fries for this, end quote. And then after this, Melinda's lawyer and Townsend began to argue in front of the court. Melinda's lawyer said he didn't appreciate the way Townsend was standing in front of Carrie with his hands on his hips, you know, suggesting that it was sort of an intimidating pose. Now, this wasn't the big time lawyer who was getting into this argument. Um, this wasn't Johnson. I don't think that he would have done that. This was uh, the public defender, the original hammer mill. So Townsend sassily replied back, that if Mr. Hammermill would tell him how he'd like him to position himself while awaiting the witness's answer, he would gladly accommodate him. And, you know, the, everybody in the courtroom's laughing and, and tittering. Maybe they were happy for the break in the tension. Maybe it was just absolutely hilarious to see two grown men fighting about where they should place their hands on their hips. But it was an actual shit show. Lawyers arguing kids dressed in black and kissing each other, lounging in the hallways, waiting for their turn to take the stand and experience their five minutes of fame. And Shanda's parents had to sit through every minute of this for four days before they were finally given their chance to speak for Shanda, the victim, the girl who had been overlooked throughout all of these shenanigans. Shanda's sister Paige was 19. She was going to nursing school, and by the time she took the stand, she was seven months pregnant with her first child. She stared directly at Melinda and said, quote, They sit and cry, but they didn't cry when they were doing it to her. Why should they cry now? Because they're in trouble. My sister doesn't have a chance to cry. She didn't have a chance at anything. She didn't have a choice but to die. End quote. Stephen Scherer cried when it was his turn on the stand and he asked for a moment to collect himself before telling the court, quote, I feel a great deep hole in my chest. My heart sags sorrowfully. What happened to my daughter goes a lot deeper than what they've done to her. They have just totally ruined our family with the loss of Shanda. It's very hard to go to work when you see the school buses and the little children getting on them. It just rips through me. I guess my mother said it best. Every morning when she gets up, she says, well, I'm just one day closer to Shanda, end quote. Steve's wife, Sharon, also took the stand, talked about her love for Shanda, how important she was to their family, and then simply asked the judge to give Melinda the maximum sentence possible. Shanda's mother, Jackie, also took the stand. She said her daughter was a compassionate person, and had the roles been reversed, she would never have allowed what happened to her to happen to any of the other four girls. She told the judge that the proper punishment for Melinda would be to place her in a cell wallpapered with pictures of Shanda's burned and mutilated body. She finished up by saying, quote, I know the law only allows 60 years. To give anything less would be an atrocity equal to my daughter's death. Anyone capable of such a horrendous crime should not be allowed on our streets. End quote. Then she looked at Melinda and stated, I hope and pray you remember these words for the rest of your life. May you rot in hell. Her words were followed by a thundering applause from the court. After hearing all of this, Melinda began wailing from her place at the defendant's table, allowing herself to be comforted by her lawyer in a very Casey Anthony-esque way. The eyes of those in the courtroom were on her, but they were stony and unforgiving. After seeing Shanda's family on the stand, witnessing their hearts break right in front of everybody's eyes, no one had much sympathy for Melinda. Melinda's lawyers did their best to distract from Melinda herself and place the blame on someone else. This time that someone wasn't Lori Tackett, it was Melinda's own father, Larry Loveless. They presented Dr. Richard Lawler, a clinical psychologist who had been hired by Melinda's legal team. Yes, hired. 
He was a bought and paid for witness. That's all I'll say about that. This psychologist claimed that Melinda suffered from borderline personality disorder, which meant she would experience constant mood swings, view herself very poorly, and always run towards extremes. He said, quote, borderlines totally love or totally hate. Everything is black and white. One minute they can tell you they love you, and the next they are spewing venom and hatred. They yell, they scream. But to be physically violent against another person? It's not typical. End quote. Um, being a teenage girl myself at one point and having raised a teenage girl already, that to me just sounds like how teenage girls typically are. Every day, they do think in terms of extremes. They do think in terms of black and white. They can hate you one minute and love you the next, but they don't kill you when they hate you. Or else I would have been dead by now already a million times because me and my daughter have gotten into it before and she screamed at me, I hate you, but she didn't kill me. I guess they were trying to still sell the narrative that Melinda had not actually taken part in the murder. So he's saying like, look, she's got this borderline personality disorder and this causes her to be this way and this way. But usually people with borderline personality disorder don't kill anybody. So that means, you know, by, by default, she didn't do it. As to why Melinda had not admitted to the abuse of her father, Lawler claimed that he believed it had been so traumatic she'd blotted it out of her memory. Once again, this grown man said things about Melinda that I believe to be very inappropriate. He claimed she was unknowingly provocative at times. He said, quote, she sits in ways that are at times provocative. She tends to lean forward in ways that move into personal distance and space. She has a way of looking at you. Even in a jail uniform, there was a cleavage so that she would lean forward and one could see that, end quote. I mean, he's the mental health professional. He could be right. She could be unknowingly provocative, I suppose, but it could also be possible that she was just an attractive teenage girl who was being sexualized by grown-ass men around her, and I feel icky hearing someone sit there and basically pull a, she was asking for it. That's just my opinion, though, guys. That's just my opinion. But it's the same kind of defense that grown men use when they abuse underage girls. She was asking for it. She's giving off the sexy vibe all the time. You know, she dresses really provocatively. She's always just looking at me with those eyes. Like, you are all imagining that. And even if it's true, doesn't mean that you have to act on it. Rant over. For now. Another mental health professional, Dr. Ellen Baker, also took the stand for the defense and claimed Melinda had the emotional intelligence of a three or four year old. Once again, I am not a doctor, but I disagree. I think that's a very drastic claim to make. We were able to clearly see that Melinda was capable of looking at love and relationships from a mature perspective. She got jealous, yes, but she was able to reel herself in at some point and apologize to Amanda for overreacting. A three or four year old would not be able to reach that point on their own. In my humble opinion, a three or four year old would function specifically on emotions and not be able to logically reason that they had gone too far by being jealous with their girlfriend. If a three or four year old had a girlfriend. It's just weird, it's weird. Okay, better example, you got a three or four year old child and this child punches their brother or sister in the face. Sometimes you have to even tell that three or four year old child that they have to apologize and explain why they have to apologize because what they did was wrong and explain why it was wrong. Sometimes they'll apologize all on their own just because they've become accustomed to it if you've done your job right as a parent, but you'll still have to explain to them, listen, you hurt your brother. Do you want to hurt your brother? No, they'll say. Do you love your brother? Yes, they'll say. Well, if you loved your brother, you wouldn't want to hurt them. So you did something wrong and you need to now apologize. And that is why you're sorry. Melinda was not that bad, right? She definitely had some issues, but she wasn't completely incapable of coming to terms with the fact that she'd gone too far with Amanda and apologized for being paranoid and trying to keep her and Shanda apart. So the same psychologist, Baker, compared Melinda and Lori, and he claimed Lori was a sociopath and had an antisocial personality. On that, Dr. Baker, we do agree. But he also claimed that neither girl was worse than the other. 
but rationalized that Melinda's issues had more to do with her inability to think and deal with her emotions, whereas Lori struggled with her impulsivity and capacity for violence. One sort of does sound worse than the other though, doesn't it, Baker? He followed this up saying he did not believe Melinda, Loveless, was a violent person. And this was ironic considering Dr. Baker had only spent a handful of hours with Melinda and had not sat down and spoken to Lori in person at all. But we have to remember, once again, he was bought and paid for by Melinda's legal team. So it makes a lot of sense, in hindsight, that he would make a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder and a, a sociopath for a teenage girl he had never even spoken to. It's very irresponsible. The prosecuting attorney Townsend knocked down Melinda's defense in a carefully worded closing statement. Quote, they would have you think that Larry Loveless is responsible for this murder. And Shanda didn't die because Lori Tackett hated her or because Lori Tackett was jealous of her. She died because Melinda Loveless wanted her dead. Can anyone doubt that the hours between 11 o'clock on the night of January 10th, 1992 and 9 o'clock in the morning of January 11th took an eternity to pass for Shanda Scherer? The hours locked in the trunk punctuated only by brief episodes of being beaten and tortured and sodomized, must have gone on forever for her. But that night did finally end for Shanda Renee Scherer. It ended in a flash of fire and smoke, which lasted only for a few minutes of your time and my time. But how long did that flash of fire and smoke last for Shanda? Surely it was another eternity before her life was choked out by the smoke and fire of her burning body. Forever. That's how long that moment lasted for Shanda. Forever. Lori Tackett's sentencing hearing was scheduled for December 28th, and her legal team, headed by a man named Will Goring, planned to follow the lead of Melinda's lawyers and blame her parents, turning her into a little lost girl who hadn't been hugged enough. And it wasn't that much of a stretch either, considering Lori's mother Peggy had basically disowned her daughter since her arrest, considering that they'd gone to Lori's old school in an effort to find a teacher who would testify on Lori's behalf, but none of them would, they would present her as someone who had never been accepted by anyone. And as a result, she became a chameleon, eager to please and desperate to be accepted. They would also do their best to villainize Melinda, a tit-for-tat move, considering that it's exactly what Melinda's lawyers had done to Lori. Melinda was put on the stand for three hours, and, you know, at first she put on a valiant show of crying and pretending the gore of the situation was just too much for her fragile constitution, but after three hours, her pitiful mask began to slip. Maybe she was hangry, maybe she was tired, or maybe, just maybe, she'd never felt any remorse at all, and the act of keeping up the facade just became too much for her. She began answering the questions like a sullen child who was facing a timeout. It was not a good look for her. Lori's lawyers attempted to blame her mother, Peggy, for being a, a religious zealot. They brought up neighbors and friends to testify that they'd seen this for themselves. Today, psychologists who have examined Lori Tackett say she suffers from chronic depression, substance abuse, gender disorder, and borderline personality disorder. They say years of child abuse make her incapable of empathy, understanding when someone is in pain, that she lacks a personality of her own and has no super ego. She can't tell right from wrong. But Lori Tackett's brother says his sister has lied about that night and other aspects of her life. She's lying about everything as far as I'm concerned. I think they're all lying. I don't just think my own sister's lying. I think they're all lying. All four of the, years should, all four of the girls should get years. And then Lori herself was also put up on the stand. And I think that this was the worst decision for her defense team. I question the intelligence of it. I honestly think she might have had a chance of appealing based on, you know, a bad counsel because this was the stupidest thing they could have ever done. She did manage to push out a few tears for the audience, most likely the first ones she'd shed since Shanda's death. She recounted how her mother would beat her several times a week if she didn't go to church, how she wanted to wear pants, but her mother forced her into dresses, which she hated. She would never make the decision to wear a dress of her own free will. So she was being forced into dresses against her will. 
She spent a lot of time talking about this. She described in great detail how multiple individuals, including a male cousin, had molested her from a young age, but upon cross-examination, her story fell apart. Townsend asked her to give the name of this cousin who had done this to her, but Lori couldn't. In fact, she couldn't give the names of anyone who had molested her or assaulted her, even when the judge told her she didn't have to say it out loud. She just had to write it on a piece of paper that only he would see. She couldn't do it. Then Townsend gestured towards Lori's flower print dress that she was wearing, and he basically said, hey, I, I thought you, you hated wearing dresses. Did your mom force you into this one too? He was trying and succeeding to show the court that Lori did things when they benefited her. She remembered things when they benefited her. For a girl who hated to wear dresses to the point where she felt being made to wear one had traumatized her irreparably, she sure was quick to jump back into one when she was trying to convince everyone she was a nice, innocent girl. And then remember her multiple personalities. Deanna the Vampire, how could we forget Deanna the Vampire? She's an iconic figure. And Sissy and Sarah and Gino. So she's questioned about these multiple personalities. And Lori said, I don't know who they are. And then backpedaled and said, well, like, I do know who they are. I know who I claimed they were, but I made them up. I lied about them. I still always wonder why she made the decision to to say that on the stand. Maybe she'd gotten her psychological report from the, the mental hospital, which basically said she was making it all up. And her lawyers were like, hey, just admit that you lied about it because they might tear you apart on the witness stand. But what it really did, it made her look like a liar. Somebody who would lie about things in order to get away with something. Somebody who you might question everything else that comes out of their mouth after that. Seeing the Achilles heel in her testimony, Townsend brought up the sexual abuse that Shanda had suffered and Lori quickly responded she didn't know anything about it, but she had just admitted to lying to her doctors about different people living in her head, so could the court really take anything she said as the truth? Townsend ended his cross-examination with a theatrical reenactment of the moment Shanda had gone up in flames, a moment Lori had still not fessed up to being a part of. Remember, she was just leaning over Shanda, trying to talk to her and give her comfort when the flames just and singed her bangs. Townsend pulled a book of matches from his pocket and he lit one, holding it in his fingers, asking Lori, how had she knelt down next to Shanda? On one knee, on two knees? What had she been planning on saying to Shanda when she was close enough to speak to her but not close enough to see where the fire had come from, and he's still holding this, this match the whole time. The court was enraptured, seeing before their eyes the last moments of Shanda Shara's life, and seeing how flustered Lori was when faced with it, and how her account of the events just truly did not make any sense. Townsend's holding the match, it's still lit, and he gets down on his knees as if he was Lori kneeling next to Shanda, and he holds this match until it burns all the way down to his fingers. That same day, Melinda Loveless and Lori Tackett were sentenced to 60 years in a federal prison, but they would be eligible for parole after 30. Nine days later, after hearing that both Melinda and Lori were entertaining offers to sell their stories to television and movie producers, Shanda's parents filed a civil suit against all four girls to prevent them from benefiting monetarily from the death of their daughter. They sued for $1 billion in damages, which was a huge amount that they never expected to receive. It was pretty much just to, to make sure that they would not ever be able to sell their stories. They wanted to make sure that Lori, Melinda, Tony, and Hope never made a cent over what they had done to Shanda. Tony Lawrence was not facing murder charges, but would still need to be sentenced for her part in the murder. Even so, the judge sentenced her to 20 years in prison, stating, quote, you knew before the murder that the other girl's actions could lead to Shanda's death. Anything less than the maximum sentence would depreciate the seriousness of the crime committed, end quote. Now, the judge claims that this decision haunted him for a long time to follow. He'd gone back and forth in his own mind on whether to give her the harshest sentence or to go a little easier on her. In the end, he said it was the call she'd made from the gas station, stating she had a golden opportunity there to tell the boy she talked to what was going on. At that point, she knew that Shanda was in dire danger, yet she made a conscious decision not to take that step to help her. In my eyes, that was unforgivable. Hope Rippy's lawyer, Daryl Oxier, who I think is a scumbag, by the way. 
just just in my opinion. He had her sentencing trial move from Madison to South Bend, Indiana, hoping to avoid the media attention. She'd already pleaded guilty to the same charges as Melinda and Lori, but Oxier felt a different judge, a female judge, one named Janine Jordan, might find Hope more sympathetic. I am so offended by this. Like, let's get her in front of a girl because this girl judge is going to be easier on her and maybe, you know, take pity on her because it's another girl. The plan was to convince the judge that Hope had been dominated by Melinda and Lori and they put a psychologist on the stand who had examined Hope to tell the court that she was very timid and had learned through her home life to avoid confrontation at any cost. This psychologist said, quote, she went along with Lori because she didn't want Lori to be mad at her. You had one girl, Lori, who wanted to kill someone, one girl, Melinda, who wanted someone killed, and you had two chumps, end quote. He's talking about Hope and Tony. The two chumps are Hope and Tony. Steve Henry also took the stand. He'd been finding it very difficult to hate any of these four girls for what they'd done. He knew it was his job to, you know, solve the mystery, figure out who had done it, bring some justice to Shanda, but he didn't enjoy the task. And there was still the mystery of who had sodomized Shanda since no one had fessed up. He claimed on the stand that he believed since neither had fessed up and both were trying to push the blame on the other, both Melinda and Lori had done it and taken part in it. At the end of this, Judge Jordan was not more sympathetic to Hope. I would say she may have been a little less sympathetic than the original judge would have been, but that's just my opinion. This is what she had to say. Quote, Hope Rippy lacked mercy. She thinks of herself as tough on the outside and tender on the inside. Neither is true. If mercy requires tender courage, and I think it does, Hope showed no courage and felt no tenderness. She decided to help Lori even though she knew it would hurt Shanda. She poured the gasoline so no one would get caught, even though she knew it would kill Shanda. Her lack of mercy of tender courage is a horrifying lesson to us all. It's too late to spare Shanda the harm that was done to her. I cannot make it right. It is beyond this court's power to reverse harm, but it is not beyond our power to touch the people in our lives. I encourage us all to learn a lesson from this, and that lesson is to nurture our children. I sentence you to 60 years with 10 years suspended and 10 years of probation. Damn! So all four of these girls went to prison, but what happened after that? Where are they now? Tony Lawrence was released from prison in the year 2000 after serving only nine years of her 20-year sentence. It's reported that she has two children and is living a very happy life in Madison, and she was just 23 years old when she was released. Hope Rippey was released in 2006 after a judge gave her five years off her sentence for good behavior. She was 29 when she was released and decided to not return to Madison, settling instead in Marion. Shanda's mother, Jackie, felt this was a miscarriage of justice, claiming that Hope had never intended to serve her sentence and pay the price for what she had done. She had been trying to get released since day one. I just am incensed by that. I, I, it's wrong. I understand that she's gotten every, well, I will tell you, not that I understand, I know for a fact, she's taken every class she could take. She's done every, she's gotten a degree and everything she can get it in, which my tax dollars paid for, by the way. It was free. She got a free education. She she did everything she could do to get out early. So Hope Rippey will be released from the Indiana Women's Prison tomorrow. Jackie Vaught says this early release happened because the St. Joseph County prosecutor at the time did not do his job. Hope had also gotten a GED and bachelor's degree while in prison. In 2011, Hope went on the Dr. Phil show and he confronted her about why she had been smiling so brightly in her mugshot as if it was a school yearbook picture. She claimed that when she had been arrested, the two detectives who were with her had been joking with her about how young she was and how uh, they had daughters or kids around the same age, almost trying to like comfort her and make her laugh and that's why she was smiling. I don't believe that. They were all kind of smiling in their mugshots except for, for Tony. I don't believe that. I think it's it's not true. On the same Dr. Phil show, Shanda's mother, Jackie, and Sister Paige were also guests and Hope, you know, is talking about how she's upset and she cries about it and Paige interrupts Hope to ask her if she was upset and crying when they were torturing Shanda and Hope replies in a very snarky way, in my opinion, actually I was. 
Paige then goes on to ask if she was crying when she poured the gasoline, and Hope responded, no, but I was crying when we left. Paige told her, quote, you weren't sad, because if you were sad, you wouldn't have done it, and you would have told somebody. You're not sad today. You just have to deal with it, because you already did it. You will always be a murderer. Hope felt that she had been rehabilitated in prison and that she'd basically grown up there. The one place I will give Hope credit is the part where Shanda's mother asked her, what had happened in her life to make her capable of doing something like that. And Hope responded, quote, I don't know that anything happened in my life that made me. I mean, I don't have an excuse like that. You know, I didn't have a horrible childhood where I was abused. And, you know, I was just like a weak kid. I appreciate that Hope didn't try to blame things in her past. And she seems to be at least moving towards accountability at this point. And when Hope looked at Jackie and said, you know, basically, I know you're never going to forgive me or you may never forgive me, but I am truly sorry. She began to cry. And I have to say, even though I am generally a very skeptical person, I believed her tears. I think she is now sorry, but I don't think she was then. Lori Tackett was released from prison in January of 2018 at the age of 43. What is very strange and unnecessary, in my opinion, is that she was released on the 26th anniversary of the day Shanda Sher's remains were found. I definitely think they could have and should have arranged for her to be released on a different day, or never, as far as I'm concerned. Of all these four girls, I don't think Lori Tackett should have ever seen the light of day again. She's a dangerous person. There's actually this website called truecrimeauctionhouse.com and a handwritten letter from Lori to someone else written while she was in prison is being auctioned off and it was initially listed for $120, but it's since been reduced to 95 because really who the hell wants that? Let's drop it to zero and throw it in the garbage where it belongs, shall we? Who wants that? This is ridiculous. While in prison, Lori gave a statement to a crime library reporter who asked her why people kill other people, as if Lori Tackett is the expert on this. Here was her response. Quote, Let's say, for instance, I know a couple of people who kill simply for the fear that they see in their victims' eyes and for the sight of blood on their bodies. My opinion is that they do it to feel superior or high on their victims' fear, and they're thirsty for the spill of blood. I'm done. This statement was given in 2002, after she'd already left her teenage years far behind her, after she'd already been behind bars for several years. Either this girl is putting on a show for the long game, or she's legitimately out of her mind and dangerous, and once again, I don't think she should have ever been released because clearly she romanticizes murder and violence and death to an extreme that is unhealthy and dangerous. Lori said it was her destiny to murder someone and spend the rest of her life in prison, so who are we to deny her the second part of that destiny? Lori claimed once again in 2002 that she had not gone into that night wanting or expecting anything to happen. It was just peer pressure that had gotten out of control. I don't believe that for a moment. Not only did she go into that night knowing something was about to go down, but she wanted it. And when Lori apologized to Shanda's mother in this video, I didn't hear the same ring of sincerity that I heard in Hope's voice. She's able to force her eyes to sort of like water, you know, but you can tell that she's acting. You can tell she's acting. She looks down. It's the same thing that actors do when they're trying to cry for the cameras. I'll put the clips of all of these in the description box so you can see them for yourself, but I know if I put them in here that Dr. Phil McGraw is going to hit me with a copyright strike. On September 5th, 2019, the last of the four girls, Melinda Loveless, was released from prison. While in prison, she spent her time training service dogs for the disabled. By 2012, she was considered to be one of the most competent and trusted trainers in the Indiana Canine Assistance Program, and oftentimes the challenging dogs would be brought to Melinda because she was able to figure out what their strengths were. A breeder who supplied dogs for the program and was also a burn victim like Shanda tracked down Jackie and convinced her to watch a video of Melinda with her dogs to see how she had changed and grown. Allegedly, Jackie said, I was really taken aback. I saw someone who was almost reborn. But the hands that once took life now nurture it. Oh, don't come over here. Hi. 
Melinda Lovelace has a leash in each hand and a new lease on life as a trainer of service dogs Good boy. for the disabled. Is you happy to see me? Huh? I had many times said that if you want to see as close to a person that has absolutely nothing inside of them, look in Melinda's eyes because there's nothing there. Jackie never wanted contact with any of her daughter's killers. You know, all I've ever said is I just wanted to serve their sentence. That's all I've ever said. I know what happened. Yeah. And but a breeder who supplies dogs to the ICANN program at the prison forged an unexpected connection. I liked it because it wasn't planned. I needed to talk to you. I'm Charlie Patrizzo, a burn victim like Shanda, convinced Jackie to watch a videotape of the new Melinda. I was really taken back. I could never, ever imagine having my own child and something happening. Um, I saw someone who um, was almost reborn. These are my babies. Someone who has learned to nurture something. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Love it. Then let it go. I think the ICANN program allows her to have something in her life that shows her unconditional love, that she can show that love back to, and there's a result. And there's never any betrayal on either side. So Jackie decided to donate a puppy to the program to be trained by Melinda, a puppy named Angel, in Shanda's memory. According to Melinda, she had not believed that Jackie had made this gesture, and it was only when Angel ran into her arms the first time they met that it finally sank in. Um, I, you know what? I didn't believe it. <laughs> not until the puppy, Angel, ran into her arms the first time they met in a crowd of people. Girl, what are you even doing? Huh? That's the one Jackie had touched, had held, had named, and I said, um, wow. It seems like Jackie's goodwill was not perceived that way by everyone. She fell under some criticism and attacks, and she responded to this, saying, it's my choice to make. She's my child. Good job. But if you don't let good things come from bad things, then nothing ever gets better. And I know that's what my child would want. My child would want this. And I agree with her. I personally wouldn't have done it, but it's none of our business who Jackie chooses to forgive or who she chooses to hate forever. That's her personal journey, and whatever she feels she needs to do to go on living day after day with a hole in her heart where Shanda used to be, that's okay by me. She helped me to actually um, heal, forgive, and grow. Rather she wanted that or not, um, she did a good thing. And I would thank her. Couldn't thank her enough. Melinda is training Angel to help someone in need. But Angel is already helping her. Angel is in good hands, and I'm doing it for Shanda, and I'm doing it for her. Yeah. A classmate of Melinda's and Shanda's had something to say when Melinda walked out of prison. Lindsay David, that classmate, says when Shanda Scherer was killed, she got a life sentence. And he says the justice system should be ashamed to let all of her killers walk free again. More than two decades have passed, but Craig Schoonover still remembers the warm eyes and big smile of Shanda Scherer. Very um, happy, always in a good mood. He also remembers being in class with Melinda Lovelace, who pleaded guilty to torturing, beating, and burning Scherer's body in a rural area of Jefferson County, Indiana. And her and I sat face to face with each other from August of 1991 till January of 92 when this happened. Loveless was released from prison on Thursday, and if Schoonover came face to face with her now, I probably wouldn't be able to hold my tongue. I mean, I would I would at least give her a nice verbal thrashing. Loveless is the last of four people to be released from prison. She convinced three other teens, Hope Rippey, Lori Tackett, and Tony Lawrence, to participate in the crime because she believed Sharer stole her girlfriend. It was like just one of the most surreal feelings ever. It's just unfortunate that she ran into some legitimate monsters that are walking among us. And now, um, you know, the last one is free. It's, it's crazy. And I also agree with him. I think that all of these four girls being out, I mean, this is 2020. Um, Melinda got released last year and Lori the year before her and Tony and Hope like several years ago. All four of them being free at this point 
it is a slap in the face, and it's a kind of sign that the justice system is incredibly flawed. At this point, we don't really know where Melinda is, but she was scheduled to serve out her parole in Jefferson County, Kentucky, so we can kind of assume she's like in that area. She was 43 when she was released, so I mean, she's got a, a pretty full life ahead of her still. But it's not just these four girls whose lives changed when they made the decision to murder Shanda Sher. As with any tragedy, their actions had a ripple effect that touched many people and altered their paths as well. Stephen Scherer, Shanda's father, died at the age of 52 in 2005. The cause of his death has not been officially released, but many believe it was from a broken heart. He never recovered from the loss of his daughter or the guilt that was weighing on him, always feeling like he may have been able to prevent it, and he turned to alcohol for comfort. It's reported that he drank himself to death. George Tackett, Lori's father, had not abandoned her as her mother did during her legal battles. He had been at that courthouse every day during her sentencing hearing, even though most of the time he chose to sit in the hallway, so he didn't have to hear it, but his presence there was a form of support for her. He was the one who'd bought her that car when she said she wanted to get a job, the car that allowed her to just travel all over the place, getting into trouble and doing stupid things, but he just wanted her to get a job and, and work and make her own money and have a life. Within a year of his daughter's sentencing, George Tackett was dead from cancer. Rumors around town were that he had refused treatment, that maybe he wanted to die. I feel bad for this guy because, you know, he, he was the one that was kind of there. He was over her. He was kind of sick of her and, and what she was doing and constantly getting into trouble, but he still kept giving her chances after she'd been acting up. And when Lori was arrested, it had been her father, George, who she'd called from prison. Maybe the guilt that he was living under knowing he provided the car that she used to kidnap and murder a 12-year-old girl, maybe it was too much and he just didn't see the point in going on anymore. And we can't wrap up this video without talking about Amanda Heverin, the catalyst to this whole tragic mess. Jackie has always placed a good deal of the blame on Amanda, and in my opinion, rightly so. She was older than Shanda, and she decided to embark on this hot and cold sexual relationship with her anyways. Shanda was 12, Amanda was 16. She took advantage of the younger girl. And I wholeheartedly feel that molestation charges should have been brought against her. On Dr. Phil, Amanda clearly has no remorse for what happened, stating you can't molest someone when she came to me first. Yes, yes you can, Amanda, especially when you're the older one and she had not yet reached the age of consent. Yes, you can molest someone. You can groom them and manipulate them, which is exactly what you did. You could also say to yourself, oh, this girl's really, really, really young, like a child, a baby. And it's kind of weird that I'm looking at her in a sexual way. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe I should like uh, reevaluate my life choices right now. And when Dr. Phil asked Amanda if Shanda's age had been a red flag for her, Amanda responded that Shanda was seeing boys who were older than she was, who older than Amanda was. So obviously Shanda knew what she was getting into. This is just so much crap, man. Like it's the same thing. It's the same thing when a guy rapes a girl at the bar and later he's like, well, I saw her flirting with other guys, so, you know, she wanted it. Oh, well, she was wearing a short skirt and, and red lipstick, so she wanted it. That is the same, same kind of justification, the same kind of bullshit. And we can't forget that Amanda was the first one who knew Melinda was talking about killing Shanda. And Melinda brought Amanda over to her house and showed her the bloody trunk, after which Amanda went home and claimed to cry, but still didn't tell her parents. She didn't call the police. She was planning on keeping that secret for Melinda. The amount of people that these girls told about what they'd done, Crystal and Amanda and uh, Carrie Pope. They were the only ones who kept that pact of silence and they weren't even in on that pact of silence. The four girls who were in on the pact of silence were not silent. Amanda was planning on keeping that secret for Melinda. And then on the Dr. Phil show, Amanda tries to push the blame off on Stephen Scherer saying that he maybe could have done more when those girls knocked on his door and asked for Shanda. After Shanda had told them to come back later, her father had asked her, hey, who were those girls? And Shanda said, they're girls from school. And Stephen was like, well, if they're girls from school and you know them, why did they ask to speak to Shanda? Wouldn't they know you were Shanda? And Shanda made an excuse and said, oh, we were joking. It's just an inside joke. It's like something we joke about. I think Amanda is absolutely disgusting for even having Stephen Shara's name in her mouth. Kids lie to their parents 
all the time and they have multiple different reasons for doing so but as a parent we don't expect that a tiny white lie is going to transform into four girls showing up at our houses after midnight to kidnap our child and kill her. Through this whole interview Amanda's basically absolutely unapologetic and when Dr. Phil tells her not to throw rocks at a dead child she responds smugly well they're throwing rocks at me. So clearly someone never did leave high school and she has plenty to be sorry for. She pulled Shanda into this whole mess and she continued to manipulate both Shanda and Melinda knowing the rivalry that she was fueling as she did so. I'm sure without a doubt she never had an idea what Melinda would go on to do and I don't blame her for that. And I don't expect high school girls to act with much maturity and foresight, but the least she could do now is accept responsibility for the part she played in Shanda's death but she doesn't. She goes on and on talking about things she lost, getting kicked off the basketball team, etc. But she didn't lose her life. She's still able to walk around the earth, to love, to lose, to feel joy, and to feel pain. Shanda lost everything. Amanda got kicked off the high school basketball team. This is the same thing, right? Same thing. It's the same thing, Amanda. Forgive me if I don't cry her a river for getting kicked off the basketball team. I'll leave you with some hopeful words from Shanda's diary written the summer before she started at her new school. Dear diary, I can't believe it, but it's true. It's time for a new school year. Let me tell you what I'm looking forward to the most and what I'm dreading the most. Well, this year I'm going to a different school. I'm kind of scared I won't fit in because I heard that there are hoods, pretty girls, and all those guys. I wish my mom would understand that I don't want to be 12. I want to be 13. I wish I could tell people I was 13 and my mom would go along with it, but I know how my mom is. She's not that kind of person, but I would love it if she would. I would work hard, but I'm already going to do that. I love my mom very much, but she doesn't understand how much that I want to be 13 and have people spend the nights on weekdays and talk on the phone after 10 p.m. Shanda wanted to be older than she was. She wanted to move forward so quickly in life. She didn't realize that her youth and innocence would be soon snatched cruelly away from her. But in her heart, she was a good girl who just wanted to be a good daughter and do well in school and be accepted by her peers. Before I end this, I want to mention a comment that was posted on part one of this series. Someone basically said I should stop writing fiction because we have no idea what Shanda was thinking or feeling. <laughs> I don't pull this stuff out of my ass, guys. I may write it in a way that sounds like a story, but I have legit sources for everything and anything that was presented as Shanda's thoughts or feelings were taken from diary entries that she had written herself. I write them down in a way that allows the story to flow and hold your attention, but I do not make things up. So just relax a little, okay? And find something real to be offended by. I'm just telling stories here. It's what I enjoy doing and I'm gonna keep doing it. I don't make things up. <laughs> so ridiculous. It's ridiculous that somebody would even make that comment on a video about a girl who lost her life and that seems to be the most important thing to talk about. Okay, that's it. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Twitter. Make sure you like this video if you liked it. Make sure to share it if you think it's worth sharing and make sure you are still subscribed if you were subscribed before. Make sure you still are. YouTube just loves unsubscribing people from my channel and if you're not subscribed and you've been here for a while watching and lurking, subscribe. What are you waiting for? Be a part of this community. It's amazing for the most part, except for people that make stupid comments, but I mean, maybe they just had an off day. I'm putting all the links for the videos that I talked about in the description box, the Manson series, the Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume series. Those are really, really good and they are very similar and hold a lot of parallels to this. So those are all in the description box. I also put links to the Dr. Phil videos and clips in the description box so you can check them out. I'm also gonna put a link of Amanda Heverin singing uh, Hello by Lionel Richie, you know, just in case you wanna be entertained by that. It is a good song. It's a good song. I don't know if she did it justice, but it's a good song. Don't leave her any hate though. Don't you know insult her in the comments. If you want to see it, just go see it. I thought it was interesting, but most likely, you know, just sending hate her way won't do anything. She probably does not care. And uh, you know, we're better than that here, right? Right? Sometimes we feel like we're not, but we are. Like, share, subscribe, and make sure you let me know what you think about this whole series in the comment section. I love talking to you guys in the comment section. Thank you so much to everybody watching. Thank you so much to my Patreons who really keep me going. You guys are the real MVPs. I love you so, so much. And until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. Bye.
Yeah. 